This is Katherine Schneider from the Fitchburg Historical Society. Uh, we are so pleased today to have with us um, a librarian from the Wisconsin Historical Society, Laura Bessler. Uh, has uh, kindly consented to uh, to be with us. And she is a reference librarian with particular um, uh, expertise in um, library archives and museum collections. So welcome, welcome, Laurie. Uh, Thank you. Today, our focus is going to be on the 1950 US Census. And Lori, could you give us kind of the <clears throat> kind of the overall big picture about the United States uh, census, why the government takes that census every every ten years, what that's about, um, and how long how long has that been taking place? We've been doing this from the very get go with this country. So 1790 was the very first census that was taken, and it was decided it would do, be done every ten years by the federal government. And so you have um, a you know, little differences in, or sometimes bigger differences in what is being asked of each person. But basically, the, one of the reasons they did this is so that they could count how many people are in the country. And they still, that still matters for representation and taxation and everything else. And so um, in the early years, 1790 to, to 1840, they were just asking the name of the head of household and then how many males and how many females, and they would break it down into um, different categories of white um, persons of color who were free, enslaved people. Um, those kinds of numbers were just tabs as to how many people were in each household. And then you also had it broken down into age groups as well. By 1850, they started asking everybody's name who was living in the household. And it's, of course, we still had states that were enslaving people. And so in those states, you also had special schedules called slave schedules. But even then, those slave schedules did not list the names of the, the enslaved, only those who were enslaving. And so um, it's interesting to look at those for 1850 and 1860. 1840 also mentions um, information of, of the people who enslaved um, others. And so 1870 is the first census really that lists everybody who is living in the United States, um, even though they are still missing information about indigenous populations. Um, so you have those kinds of categories that are happening over time. Um, by 1900, they're actually asking a lot more questions about those who had immigrated. And so you see a, a, a rise in the immigration of those coming from other countries into the United States by about 1890. And so by 1900, they're thinking, hmm, we should probably try and gather some stats on this. And so they start asking questions like, you know, what's your name and, and how old are you, but also are you, were you born in another country and what was that country and what year did you immigrate and are you a citizen? Have you started the process? Are you not at all started in the process? Have you fulfilled the process of becoming a citizen? Very detailed questions. So 1900 to 1950 has a great amount of detail in the censuses. Um, those that are earlier, 1850 to eight, 1900, um, give a little less. And of course, 1790 to 1840 um, certainly give the least amount, but they're still valuable for those doing family history because, and that's most of the people I think using these other than social historians, um, are the general public who are looking at their family, finding a way to pin them down as to where they're living at a certain time in a certain place. So the censuses are core to family history. Oh, great. And so much variation through time, what the United States government was interested in finding out, uh, yes. depending on what was, happen what was happening in the country. Um, would you fill us in on why the 1950 census is in the spotlight this year? What's so important about the 1950 census? Well, 1950, um, the, the way that the reason it's being released or had gotten released on April 15th is that, uh, or April, it was April 1st. I can't remember now. It's been a while. <laughs> but anyway, it was released in April um, because there's a 72 year privacy act that prevents those from being released until 72 years after the census was taken and so, or was created. 
And so 1960, we have to wait another 10 years to view. Now this 72 year privacy act was enacted in 1978. Um, by the federal government. And so that's why we don't have access to those. And that's why all of us family historians were looking for that April date to come around for us to, oh, we get access now. <laughs> the problem is, is that right away it wasn't indexed because those big companies like Ancestry or the private organizations like the Latter-day Saints, they also didn't have access to those. And so indexing happens at that level of those private organizations. Um, and so the fully indexing of it I would guess will be done by June. Um, judging on how fast uh, the 1940 got released 10 years ago, um, and how fast it, it got indexed. And so you have the, that's the reason why 1950 is pretty exciting for us family historians. Oh, for sure, 1950. And I must say personally, I am going to be on that census that's going to be ah. released. <laughs> so yep. it's it's really interesting that that privacy so privacy is really the issue with not uh releasing that data until 72 years later that's correct that's correct i'm keeping right. a cat at bay here <laughs> <laughs> um so yes there's that privacy act that prevents it otherwise all right and then um specifically what can you find on the 1950 census what is maybe unique about that particular census well, you know, it's interesting, 1940 and 1950 kind of share a very unique situation with them. And that is that um, they have additional columns of information, additional lines for certain people who fall on certain lines in those censuses. And so every, you know, 10th line or something, they designate that as a person who gets additional questions. And those questions are listed at the bottom of the page. And so that's very similar to 1940, but it does ask uh, more detailed questions. It, what I found the most glaring when I first looked at these is the column headings. It was interesting how they worded the questions. In 1900, if you look at those columns, all the other censuses really, if you look at the columns, it's about this person. Where was this person born? Where was this person? How old is this person? In 1950, they say, how old is he? Like, what, why would you do that? <laughs> Don't get away. Why would you do that? There are women being noted here too. And yet the column headings definitely say he. So I'm very interested to see what social historians say. How did that shift? What was going on in the, the minds of the people who developed these questionnaires? So that was interesting to see. Hmm. Rather unique aspect. Yeah. To, to the 1950 word. Oh, definitely. For a lot yeah. of people, though, the 1950 means that they can try another source that will help them find those hidden people, those people who have strayed away from the family story. And they, they were still living by 1950, and they don't know where they ended up. Those daughters who got married in the 40s, and we don't know who they married, so we don't know how to find them. They might be um, people who uh, have strayed away from the family for whatever reason, and yet the 1950 census probably will catch them and have them listed. And so that's why it's so important. It gives us another source um, closer to our generation that could give us information about those family members. Hmm. Like finding detective work, finding the missing people. And it is. Here, it's exciting that way. Yeah. yeah. Here's, here's a place to do it, a way to... A way another to source. It. Another source. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Laura, as a reference librarian, um, so who do you anticipate... We'll be searching through this census and how the census information will be used. So the censuses, um, I would guess that most of the people going into them um, will go through either National Archives or archives.gov. Ancestry.com has it available to look at for free right now. And Family Search, which is a Latter-day Saints website, also has it available to look at for free. Those two companies, Ancestry and um, Family Search is not a company, it's a church, but those two are doing most of the indexing, okay? You do have it on other sites like MyHeritage and I believe maybe Find My Past, but the other two are, are mostly the ones that people go to. And so <clears throat> being that it's not indexed, a lot of the family historians may be waiting a little bit until that indexing has caught up. 
Um, I think social historians are also going to be obviously looking at that. But to tell you the truth, a lot of historians are looking at the data that has been put together. And so that's been available for everybody to look at for years. They started putting those reports together right away, and that is available. It's not um, held by that 72-year Privacy Act. So you really have the local and the family historians looking at these. Ah, I see. So the data, the data, the general data then has been available. So oh, yes. my next question was going to be like the, the census. This is right after World War II, the 1950 census, first census taken after World War II, which were major social changes um, during that period of the war. Um, so just wondering if if trends like immigration you mentioned earlier, um, where population shifts were taking place, uh, where were people moving, you know, which states were gaining population, um, minorities, where they were located, how many people were, evidence of baby boomers, numbers showing up, you know, right. uh, can you find these things within the data of the 1950 census, those kinds of types yes. of information? Yes, yes. I think what's yeah, happened think what's is, happened. like I said, the research has been being done since 1950. And so <clears throat> gathering all that data and then putting that into one kind of report by the Census Bureau um, and then social historians working with that, that data. There are lots of resources people can use to find the answers to those specific questions and other social questions. Immigration was coming down a bit. And so at that time, and so you have um, different, uh, different um, patterns that you'll see in history, a lot of still urban or rural uh, residences, the GI Bill was in place, but a lot of people had not actually fulfilled their usage of that yet. And so you still have the data being collected in 1950. You're going to see a lot more data in 1960 to answer those questions about the baby boomers than you will in 1950. Mm -hmm. Baby boomers are still pretty young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for that census, okay. and a lot of information on the Census Bureau. So if you went to archives.gov for the National Archives, or if you went to um, the Census Bureau's website, then there are a lot of nice little articles, not extensive studies, which can be you can be swimming in for the rest of your life. But they have really good articles out there um, on sites like that. There are other sites you have to be careful of, of course, what sites you're looking at and seeing what information they're providing. But I would go with National Archives um, as a good place to start. Oh, great, great. That's wonderful to know how the average person can access this information and find out the name specifically of yes. family members, where they lived, uh, what's going on, like a snapshot of of your family during this during this time, the year nineteen fifty. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting with Ancestry.com, they have what's called the library edition, and that's available for you to use for free um, at your local library. I'm sure that the Fitchburg Public Library has access to that as well. Anybody, any library in the South Central Library System should give you free access to that. And so that is one place. And then also all of those reports, if you are interested in the social reports that have come out from the government, we have access to those at Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, so there's lots of information to be found in both locations locally. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Laurie. And uh, finally, anything else that you'd like to tell us about the census that I might not have asked yet? Any oh, they're, they're just so interesting. If you had, if you have family who appeared in the census or should be appearing in the census, I think it's worth looking at, you know, one aspect of censuses is that it may not come down through the family oral history who had lived in our households, our family households. You know, you go back far enough and you have laborers living in those households along with the family. You have boarders, you have, you know, neighbors, you have nannies. I haven't, uh, my father had a nanny that lived in the household. And so it's interesting to look at the data that is, you know, the questions that are asked and what answers they gave. 1930 census, is it 1930? Maybe 1940, asked if the family had a radio. And so you have really interesting questions over each census year. So, and if anyone is interested in family history, how do I get started? What do I do? The censuses are the first place I direct people to. 
And so if you do have questions about that, we have staff who help people get on the, the track for genealogy for that journey. I will tell you, it's hard when you get going, though. You, you can't say no. You got to keep going then. So <laughs> there's so much to be found. There's always more, isn't there? Yes. Always more to know. Yes. Well, Lori, and one final question. Just uh, what do you enjoy most about your job, uh, do, oh. being, being an archive librarian and museum? I get, I get to go back into 1950, into 1890, into 19, 1820. I get to travel history every day I'm at work. And to help people look and uncover those family stories is just really rewarding. And that's a big part of what I do is help people find more about their family history. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Well, Lori, thank you so much for just giving us that peek at the 1950 census and what's going on there, what we can and, and then how we can we can find it and research it ourselves. Um, and knowing uh, again, thank you for the the Wisconsin um, Historical Society's uh, resources that are available to anyone, uh, anyone who who has that interest. Yes. So, and I'm just going to remind people about the Fitchburg Historical Society because we have a website that we like to advertise to people, which is the FitchburgHistory.org, which is also a searchable area to find uh, resources and information about Fitchburg history. And we also have availability of people doing some research on their on their family histories there too. So Lori, thank you again so much for being with us today. So, You're welcome. So your time. Not a problem. Take care. Thank you.